Hello there, you are listening to the Earful Tower Podcast. My name is Oliver G, an Australian in Paris. What am I doing here? Who knows? But I'll tell you this, today's episode is a slightly different one because I don't have a guest. It's just me sitting here talking to you. So if you join today hoping to hear an interesting guest, you're stuck with me, but I've got an interesting topic for you. The topic is when the Seine River floods. And I've divided this into three sections. One is the present, one is the past, and one is the historic past. This is something that interests me to no end, really. I love this. I find it uh, particularly fascinating. And it's uh, it's relevant right now because the water level right now is kind of trickling over the embankments and threatening to give Paris a good washdown. Don't be alarmed, though, when I say that. Paris isn't about to flood like it did 110 years ago. That's right, we'll be talking about the 1910 floods later on. But this episode will include some fun things to find around the city if you're interested in a little trivia, flood-related trivia, some facts, and uh, a lot of excited babble from me, your host, Oliver G. And just a word of warning, in the chaos and the fun that comes with this episode, there's a chance that I might use the word embankment wrong. So, just that we're all on the same page here, and so that you can imagine it, the water in the Seine comes up against a small wall. I've referred to that as the embankment, and I think it technically is. But if you're imagining Paris, there are very large embankments, like a a further one along, which is like six meters high. It's enormous. That's kind of a wall. If I say embankments and flooding the embankments at the moment, I'm talking about the low ones. If it was flooding the top embankment, everybody would be talking about a flood in Paris right now. This isn't the case. It's just trickling over the edges at the moment. Now, you are listening to the Earful Tower podcast, and we're talking about the Seine River. Let's get into it. So, yes, no guest. Just me today, but I think I can keep you entertained uh, talking about the river flooding. For some reason, I find this particularly fascinating. But before we get into the intriguing past and the stories from uh, recent years and many, many years ago, I want to talk about today. And to talk about today, I'm going to need to set the scene a little bit. I am living currently for this whole next month, all of February, on the Ile Saint-Louis. If you've never heard about that before, if you don't know what I'm talking about, firstly, you should listen to the last episode, but secondly, it's one of the natural islands in the Seine River. And I'm sure there's someone listening who's got no idea what I'm talking about. Paris is roughly divided into two. The left bank, which is the south side, and the right bank on the north side. And uh, you can tell which is left and which is right by looking downstream. Two of these islands, one is called the Ile de la Cité, which is where Notre Dame is. You've surely been there before if you've been a tourist in Paris. The other is Ile Saint-Louis, which is uh, more of a sort of residential area. It's pre houseman and the history on this island dates back uh, 2,000 years when the Romans came, pretty much. So that's where I'm living. I'm surrounded by the Seine River, and it's particularly fascinating. It just it is being right down there close to the water. Uh, going for a walk around the island. I love it. I absolutely love it. And I love the Seine in general. I love seeing Paris from a boat on the Seine. I love seeing the Seine from Paris. I love seeing it from the embankments, walking along, looking at the water. I just, I'm a huge fan of it. And never do I like it more than when something unusual happens, like a flood. So in Paris, in recent days, in almost weeks, and in fact, for the next week too, it's going to be raining. A lot of rain, and when the rain falls in Paris and obviously beyond in central France, we get a bit of a flood in the river. Now, in case you're worried about this whole idea of flood, there's nothing to worry about. It happens every year, almost at exactly this time. More often than not, it's nothing to worry about. But a couple years ago, it was particularly bad. And I'm going to talk about that in a sec. But first, we're going to talk about what it's like today. I want to set the scene for you, because today I went for a long walk to investigate it. And I did a loop of the Ile Saint-Louis and just tried to sort of sense how bad it was. And to paint a picture, if you've been to Paris before, you know that uh, leading from sort of the the road level down to the water, you often go down a big sort of staircase, a concrete staircase. The bottom step is underwater in most places. And what that means is in most places, you can't walk down those steps and walk around the, uh, the banks of the Seine. Also on this walk, I saw, so if you want to imagine it, I went for a walk around the island, went to Peloton. 
the coffee shop, got a coffee, and then from Peloton, we walked down to the banks of the Seine. Now, if you haven't been to Paris for a while, I'm going to rock your world. That big sort of highway that runs along the water, that got pedestrianized two or three years ago, and now it's always full of uh, people running, rollerblading. Yes, that's a thing in Paris. Uh, Cycling, uh, you know, just going for a walk. That's really cool down there. But if you're walking down there now, you'll see there's some pretty big sort of puddles from where the water has gone over the embankment and filled it up. So big that in some places you have to sort of walk along the curb to keep going. Also, when you're standing at the edge looking into the water, you'll see that it's only like maybe one hand length from coming over the edge. That's how far we are from sort of breaching the embankments there. And uh, if you look at the water running past the the sort of bridges, you'll see that it, it's rushing quite quickly, and there's a lot of debris coming through. So uh, it's kind of it's pretty different, and it's a little bit exciting. So we continued along this embankment, crossed over the Pont Neuf, the famous bridge, the old bridge, which I've been meaning to do an episode about forever, and we went onto the Square du Vert Gallon. It's that little sort of triangular corner of the Ile de la Cité. I'm sure you've seen it before. At the very end, it kind of looks like a boat, and there's like a weeping willow hanging over the top of it, and you need to go down those stairs under the statue of the of the king on the horse. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes, you do. Of course you do. We went down there, and uh, the water had completely circled the the path where you usually walk there and to get in you had to wade through not much water not enough to put some people off but to put most people off so there are still some people walking across it but you're going to get wet shoes so if the rain continues as it has been on sunday night now i assume that that will become a new island which is pretty cool as well uh so we went and checked all this out today and uh i don't know if i mentioned it yet on the show lena got me a a camera my wife lena got me a, a proper camera for christmas so I've been taking pictures like a madman. I'm going to put all the good pictures up on uh, the EarfulTower.com, my website, so you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, but we continued back along the left bank, and uh, it felt like, because it, it started raining as we walked, and as we walked up towards the Notre Dame, it was uh, it got harder to get down and walk along the Seine. And then on the way back again to the Ile Saint-Louis, uh, brief pause into Shakespeare and Company, the bookshop. I'll just jump off topic for a second. I was in there two days ago. I signed 50 copies of Paris on air. And when I say signed, I really signed them. I didn't just squiggle my name. I wrote things. I wrote things like, this book is best enjoyed on one of those green metal chairs in the Luxembourg Gardens. You know, those kind of things. Or this book is best enjoyed with a fresh croissant. Mind the crumbs! And then my name. So I did 50 of them. It took me ages. And... uh, I mentioned that in the newsletter. So if you're subscribed to the newsletter, you would already, maybe they're already sold out. I don't know. Uh, but you will get that stuff ahead of everybody else. Ahead of everybody else. If not, go on shakespeareandcompany.com and search Paris on air. Anyway, enough of that. But after leaving there, we, uh, we headed back along the left bank and back home as it really started to rain. And uh, it was just really beautiful. I don't know what it is. And I think Lena finds it quite funny. I'm like a child running around taking pictures when the sand starts flooding. Even though it happens every year, I just find it particularly magical. And so I got home and uh, because we've just come back to Paris after a while in Sweden, I'm a little bit behind with the podcast. I thought, what am I going to do for an episode? Maybe I'll share my excitement for this flooding river with you all. So I sat down and started researching and that's how we start getting into the past of this magical river when it floods. Are you ready for a story? Let's jump into part two. So to understand the flooding scene, you need to look back in time. And as I said, I've done this and I've done it a lot over the past years. If you're new around here, you maybe don't know, I used to be a journalist in Paris. One of my favorite stories, and I'm 100% serious, one of my favorite stories that I ever did during that time was covering the flooding Seine. And this happened a couple of times, most notably in June 2016. Why do I love these kind of stories and why do I think it's so fascinating? Let me tell you, in the time that I worked as a journalist in Paris, which was two years, 2015, 2016, there were a lot of horrible stories, a lot of awful stories uh, and I don't even want to get into them. I think you guys know what they all were. And it was it was hard. It, it got me down just, you know, round the clock reporting, always looking at your phone. Uh, but when the Seine flooded, thankfully, everyone was okay. There was bad news in that uh, a lot of businesses had to close and uh, a lot of buildings got damaged. But it was like this 
fascinating natural sort of not really disaster but phenomenon and it was happening slowly you know like if there's a phenomenon like an earthquake or a, or an explosion of a volcano it's over in a couple of hours but this went on for a few days and i just kept going down to the river to look at it i was even interested in looking at the people that were going down to look at the river flooding so uh, the people, what I mean by that is like, uh, you know, it felt like it could have been Paris a hundred years ago. There were the people that were, you know, just there to spectate. This brought out people who were, you know, pickpockets and people trying to thieve off these people, people trying to sell to these people, uh, you know, shops that were closed, shops that were finding opportunities, people, I don't know, there was just this really unusual vibe that I just wanted to be part of. But not just that, seeing a city that you're so used to seeing that doesn't change very much. In fact, Paris isn't like, I don't know, London that sort of changes its face all the time with new buildings going up. Paris kind of stays the same, especially down around the river. So seeing it rise so high meters, like it really rose a lot, it was just fascinating. Like a sort of evolving painting or something. So I was down there taking pictures all the time. And at the time, it was exciting as well because... um a lot of the news channels wanted to talk. I remember I was, I did some video on like the the world service of BBC, so people around the world were getting in touch. I saw you in Paris. It was there was a kind of fun side to it as well that people, you know, people were interested in the news in Paris for a sort of different reason to the to the sad. I don't know. It was just one of those cool moments. And any time that it happened since then, I've always been down there checking it out. It happened again in 2018 in January. The one in 2016 was around June, but that was uh, covering it. You obviously do it as a reporter as well, so you learn a lot about it. And uh, some of the things that I think you guys might find interesting that you can see on your next trip to Paris or if you're in Paris today are the little sort of hidden clues about floods in Paris. One of the things that I found particularly interesting is how uh, the locals measure whether the Seine is flooding or not. And uh, what you need to know about this is there's a statue and the statue is called the Zouave, Z-O-U-A-V-E, or if you're American, Z-O-U-A-V-E. And uh, I looked it up. It's a statue from 1856, made by the French artist Georges Dibault. That's not a very French sounding name, is it? Dibault? Sounds German. Anyway, it's uh, right there on the Pont de l'Alma which is uh, very close to where Princess Diana died. And uh, the way that you can tell if the river is flooding is how high the water is coming on this statue's body. It's a pretty big statue. It's 5.2 meters, it's, which is 17 feet. It weighs 8 tons. And if you're interested, if you think you've seen it before, you might have seen it uh, when taking a picture of the Eiffel Tower, which is not too far in the distance uh, over the Pont de l'Alma. But uh, rather than me trying to explain what this Zouave looks like, look, I'm just going to read to you from the internet here. It wears the traditional uniform based on the styles of clothing worn in North Africa in the early 1800s with short open-fronted jacket, sashes, and baggy trousers gathered above the ankle. And this particular statue has removed its fez and is resting on a grounded rifle. So now hopefully that is enough for you to imagine, but... What's cool about it is that it's an informal flood marker. When the water rises up high, that's when you know it's flooding. So uh, back in uh, 2016, the water reached, I'd say, uh, the Zouave's groin, looking at my own pictures. And if you look at what it looks like on a normal day, the water has got to be like a meter and a half away from his feet. So how bad is the flooding today? It's, it's lapping. The water is lapping at his uh, feet. So it's not quite flooding, but if it goes any higher, they're going to have to close all the embankments. And uh, apparently the river is unnavigable by the time the water reaches his thighs. But what happens when it goes above his thighs? Well, that has happened. And that brings us to the third section of this podcast episode today. The 1910 flood, the Great Flood of Paris, they call it the Grand Cru. Uh, 1910, the water reached the shoulders of the Zouave. Now, if you're sitting there driving somewhere, Minnesota, Sydney, I don't know, you're finding the Zouave hard to imagine. Don't forget, I'm going to add pictures. But this is a big statue. Like I said, 5 meters, 17 feet. When the water goes from a meter below his feet to his shoulders, you can expect some serious flooding in Paris. And that is exactly what happened. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this uh, really intriguing part of French history. And that's how we're going to end this podcast.
bit of a different episode today, huh? Not usually that I do something like this, but I was inspired. I hope you're enjoying it. But I want to talk to you about the 1910 flood. You guys out there who are huge fans of Paris, you surely know about it or you've heard about it. For those who don't have any kind of uh, knowledge about this story, let me paint a picture. In 1910, in this great flood, this was a catastrophe. This wasn't uh, anything like uh, what's happening now. This is nothing. In fact, the the worst this is going to be right now is like a, a little alert at the end of a news story, as fascinating as it might be to someone like me. But when it happened in 1910, it was extremely serious. The water rose eight meters above the ordinary level. And why it was so sort of debilitating for the city is it didn't go by flooding the banks and sort of trickling over in a way that they could perhaps have prevented. Rather, it took them by surprise by going through the sewers and the tunnels and the metro stations and rising up into the streets. So maybe you've seen, and I'm going to attach a lot of these pictures, but there are photos of just normal streets kind of far from uh, the Seine River that are absolutely flooded, just properly flooded. People going around in boats. There's pictures of of guys in metro stations, and where the train goes through the, the sort of metro tunnel, the water is almost at the top of that tunnel. It just drowned the city, really. It was a proper catastrophe in terms of the damage that was done, which uh, I've read estimated $1.5 billion in today's money. No one died, but uh, the flood, the flood itself lasted a good week and it was more than two months before things got back to normal. And what I really like about it is if you uh, see the pictures online, a lot of these were made into uh, postcards at the time, is uh, engineers and firefighters and police all got together to make these sort of bridges so that people could get around the city because just a huge a huge percentage of central Paris was underwater. Like, I'm not talking about a few puddles here. When you see the pictures, you'll see that they made these long gangplanks uh, so that people could get from A to B. But also, you know those sort of famous metal chairs that I mentioned before uh, in those uh, the parks around Paris? They also made long lines of them so people would walk along the chairs to just to get around. And these pictures, they're better to be seen than to be uh, explained by me, of all people anyway, but I've gathered them together. I've gathered together a whole bunch of them to go with my new pictures. They're going to be at the top of the earfultower.com. If you're really struggling to find it, I'll make a special link, the earfultower.com slash flood. But what's particularly fascinating, if you are driving, you want to imagine, is looking at the people of 1910 and the way that they dressed to walk around in a flood. Imagine in 2021, people who know they're going to have to be walking across planks, likely to get wet. Uh, I mean, I saw it today. The people were just wearing very ordinary clothes. But this is 1910, the end of the Belle Epoque. This is before World War I. This is before Coco Chanel came along and made uh, fashion so much more practical especially for women. So if you can imagine it, all the men and all the women, even the children are wearing hats, top hats, bowler hats, big fancy fur hats, uh, lots of big, you know, it's the middle of winter as well, so big coats, uh, sort of impressive looking shoes. These people should not have been walking around on the top of chairs going across flooded streets in Paris. And a Paris that I should say looks very much like Venice. But I'm going to point out one more picture. Pretty sad, to be honest, but the strongest of the pictures that showed just kind of how messed up it was for me was the Jardin des Plantes, a zoo in in Paris uh, near the Seine. There's a picture, I'm looking at it now, of the polar bears in the zoo. And they're in a sort of, it's not a cage, it's, it's walled in. And they're up to their sort of knees in water. And there's another picture of it too, where one seems to be trying to climb out and uh, more well-dressed Parisians are looking down on it. It's just a fascinating image. It is, it's got to be one of the weirdest Paris images. Just a whole different time. And thankfully at a time when we have photographs. Black and white, of course, but uh, absolutely fascinating. They'll be on the site, theeviltower.com. Anyway, the 1910 floods uh, were responsible for another part of Paris that remains today that I would wager a lot of you guys have never noticed or at least never maybe understood is that as you walk around Paris especially near the river, but in other places too, you sometimes find the word 1910 with a horizontal line next to it. Of course, now I'm sure you can guess that is marking how high the river got. So if you walk along the embankments of the Seine, sometimes extraordinarily high up, like too high up to really understand on the top of those walls, there's a line saying 1910, but sometimes you can see it on the other side of the banks, uh, the word crue, C-R-U-E, might be there as well, which is the word for flood. 
and markers in various places around the city pointing to this great flood and giving you an idea of Paris of yesteryear. These are the kind of things I love in the City of Light. Hey, maybe you call it the City of Lights, but those kind of, I don't know, little in-jokes almost, little wink-wink facts, information, things that you would totally miss if you weren't looking out for them. But when you know where to look, you feel like you can appreciate the city on a whole different level. Anyway, that is enough from me talking about the Seine flooding. Let's see where it goes in the coming days. Hey, maybe by the time you listen to this, it'll already have started to recede. But uh, if you are ever in Paris, in especially in late January, the winter flood is always something worth keeping an eye out for if you're intrigued by these sort of things like I am. But uh, look, thanks for listening to the episode. I want to do a little shout out. If you are a Patreon supporter, if you're a member of this show, check your inboxes because we've updated the city guide, the Paris city guide for 2021. Obviously, a lot of uh, restaurants and cafes and stuff are closed right now, uh, but we've made sure to update it accordingly and to add a bunch of stuff that's come from 2020 on the Eiffel Tower podcast, things to see, especially things you can see without needing to worry if it's open or not. If you've got no idea what I'm talking about, this is a PDF guide with, it's got to have, I don't know, three or four hundred things to do in this city. Lots of roundups from all the work that I've done on this podcast over the years. And it's totally free if you sign up on patreon.com slash the Eiffel Tower. 10 US dollars a month to become a fully fledged member. I hope to see you on the other side. After all, today is the first day of the month. It's actually the perfect time to sign up on Patreon. If you sign up at the end of the month, you get charged for that month. So why not sign up on the first day? If you aren't a member, eventually I'll get around to selling that online. But uh, obviously, as usual, it's a thank you for the people who are members of this show and who make it happen. Now, before we finish, I usually uh, read out uh, an email or a letter. i got to say, there have been a lot of emails coming in recently. I Very recently, I went into the, um, the uh, P.O. box, the post box that we've got on the Champs-Élysées and collected all the Christmas cards that you guys sent in. How lovely. If you want to send in a letter or if you want to send in a, a complaint or whatever, 34 Avenue de Champs-Élysées. Pretty cool, huh? But yeah, thanks so much for sending those in. That was, in all seriousness, that was extremely touching and uh, a massive thanks for those of you who have done that. But also, thanks to the people who leave a review. I'm going to read one out. It's from Robert Crowder. He's put a five-star review. I, I, I'm so grateful for these five-star reviews. I'm happy to read them, especially when they're lovely like this. He says, this is a transportive podcast with a host that has an infectious personality. Infectious, maybe the wrong choice of words during a pandemic, Robert. But he says, I've been listening to the Eiffel Tower for almost two years. And finally, sorry it took so long, Oliver. Finally, I got around to, yeah, about two years before leaving a review. He got around to providing a review. The New York Times called this one of the most transportive podcasts, and I completely agree. Oliver does a fantastic job with the show, and his interviews are very engaging. Before coming across the earful, I was not a huge fan of Paris. Simply didn't feel it lived up to the hype. But I gave this show a shot on my commute, and I've grown increasingly more interested in Paris because of the details covered, locations discussed, and people interviewed. Gosh, now I feel guilty that this episode didn't have any interviews. He says, I now always look forward to listening to the latest episode on Mondays. So if you're interested in travel, Paris, or finding a great podcast, I highly suggest giving the Earful Tower a listen. I didn't really need to read that last bit, seeming uh, if you're listening to this review, it means you listened to an episode already. But thank you, Robert, for leaving those reviews. As I've said before, I don't know if reviews actually help the podcast, but one thing I do know is that uh, occasionally, it doesn't happen very often, but occasionally someone does leave a sort of less savory review, <laughs> maybe my uh, my mortal enemies or something, and a good review is always good to push that one down. So if you're feeling in a good mood, do it. If you enjoy the uh, the book, Paris on Air, you can leave a review on Goodreads or Amazon. I love that too. But uh, look, thanks to all who listen to this show. It means a great deal to me. I'm looking forward to spending this next month on the Ile Saint-Louis. If you're an Instagram user, that is where I'm most active in terms of social media. I'm extremely likely to answer your questions and chat with people there. I don't know. I find that's the most... uh, I guess Paris is a visual city, and I do all the audio stuff here on the podcast, so I guess I do all my social media on Instagram. But yeah, I'm on YouTube and Facebook too, so you can go find me there. But look, that's enough from me. You guys have things to do. I've got a flood to go and investigate. 
I'll talk to you again in a week. And wherever you are, whatever you're doing, I hope you have a lovely week. Merci. Au revoir.